Um, first of all, thanks, uh, a warm thanks to Anna and Alexander for uh, uh, organizing this and, have, uh, and inviting me here. Um, so. uh, politics and art are characterized by the same aporia. The power at stake in both always contains a characteristic antinomy. Social and political institutions are always projects being realized. They are products of the imagination being tested in reality. In that sense, they are a lot like works of art. Political institutions presuppose general rules, which nevertheless have, uh, are always invented by people, and this is precisely where they differ from natural laws. At one time, they originated in the mind of an individual. They have not always been there. And this is why, paradoxically, the structure of institutions also presupposes the possibility of negation, change and disobedience. Rules are challenged, ignored, disputed, revised or eliminated. If not, they deteriorate into coercion or violence. Political institutions therefore navigate to the rhythm of time between general validity and the particularity of their creation, between equality and individual differences, between unity and the plural aims of the multitude. If we try to provide a general or abstract definition of institutions, we can, also, we can say that an institution is a relationship that binds the subject to society through collective historical forms of agreement that are made possible by space-time dimension that in turn has been put into motion by language. The subject is neither impenetrable nor a free-floating cell. Through language, the subject is social and always connected to structures that are also social. Language is the most elementary institution and this clarifies the following. With institutions, we are not exclusively dealing with an actual reality, but always also with a possibility, with a could be, a force or power that carries its own contradiction and negation within it. Each can also implies a cannot. The aporia resulting from the verb can is aptly illustrated by many experiences of art. It is, however, also a common human experience, which makes it tragic and explains why it is such a recurrent theme in the repertoire of art production. The tragic aporia thus is both what takes place in the artistic experience itself and the content of the artwork, that which is expressed by it. Linguistically speaking, the tragic aporia is both object and subject. All art, regardless of its medium, takes place at a primary level and at a meta, meta level at the same time. All art is reflective. It thinks itself, just like politics and languages do. In the work of the Italian philosopher Paolo Virno, a reflection on the aporetic nature of politics and art can be found. Even though he has written next to nothing about art as such, Virno is quite popular among art theory, theorists. By his own account, this is primarily because of the concepts that he uses to interpret, con interpret contemporary social phenomena, such as virtuosity. According to Virno, the experience of the performing virtuoso artist is characteristic of both contemporary political action and post fordist labor. It is also characteristic of that typically human form of activity that precedes all other activities, language. post fordist labor changed into virtuosity. At the moment it became linguistic and communicative, or when general abilities were applied economically and historically. Virno connects the dissemination of art, which nowadays starts with the very process of production, to a theory about creativity and a theory about political institutions. In an essay entitled The So-Called Called Evil and the Critique of the State Form, Virno presents a, th a thought experiment that makes use of the conceptual framework of the conservative author par excellence, Carl Schmitt. This ideologue of totalitarianism 
argues that institutions are a necessity because man is a dangerous animal. The coercion and discipline of institutions is a necessary protection against human evil. Schmidt identifies institutions with authoritarian state institutions and coercive one-way traffic. Anyone who begs to differ, liberals as well as anarchists and communists, is naively and wrongly assuming that man is by nature good. According to Firno, Chomsky is illustrative of such a naive critique of state institutions. In a remarkable turn, Virno reads Schmidt anachronistically as a preemptive critique of Chomsky. We cannot simply dismiss Schmidt's propositions as the authoritarian tendency of a conservative author because it contains an anthropological truth that is supported by the critical insights of enlightened thinkers, Freud, for example. People are not good. But in Freud's work, Wien also finds an argument against the authoritarianism. It is a form of compulsive repetition. We know that people are driven by, by two opposite impulses. Sometimes they lose sight of reality. reality. There are no rules. While at other times, they are threatened by external dangers and the rules take over. Institutions regulate the economy of the oscillation between these two impulses. But it becomes problematic when the rules governing an institution deteriorate into pathologic, compulsive repetition. The problem with humans is that unlike other animals, they do not have a specific environment. Culture is ambivalent in that it wards off dangers, but also multiplies risks. Culture protects humans from their own nature by shielding them from their malleability and indefiniteness. But at the same time, it is the most important expression of that same malleability and indefiniteness. Thus, culture encourages the development of the very characteristics it seems to afford us shelter from. Both good and evil presume a deficit of instinctive orientation, and they feed on the uncertainty regarding that which could be something other than it is. Contingency is <clears throat> the distinguishing characteristic of human practice. Political theories become weaker or more dangerous the more they cherish the illusion of being able to avoid this paradox. <coughs> Institutions offer real protection only and exclusively, and I quote Firno, if they demonstrate at all times that they belong to the domain of that which could be something other than it is. End quote. To the question we are facing today, what real democratic institutions of the multitude might look like, Virno would answer by referring to the figure of the Jewish exodus. Rather than submitting to the, <clears throat> to the pharaoh of Egypt or rebelling against his regime, the Israelites left the country. They undermined the monopoly of the pharaoh's decision by resourceful withdrawal. When discussing the Exodus narrative, it is crucial to keep in mind the key elements of discord and protest, the grumbling in the desert. The centrality of discord excludes the possibility that the resource for withdrawal could be based on the illusory goodness of mankind. In the essay for a natural history of creativity, Virno elaborates a theory of creativity and art wherein he identifies creativity with adaptation to the environment. If the specifically human ability to change behaviors and representations is not the prerogative of exceptional geniuses, but coincides with the instinct of self-preservation, then it is necessary to extend the concept of this preservation instinct and acknowledge its complexity. If creativity means an adaptation to the environment, this adaptation in turn requires aesthetic categories in order to be adequately defined. If one conceives of creativity as an adaptive process, then it would exclude a domain of intellectual, ethical or artistic, artistic freedom beyond the primary life context where we respond to the stimuli of our environment. 
so conceived that this creativity excludes the existence of free will. Creativity is inherent in the way in which we apply a rule in a particular case, or the way in which we use an intellectual principle with universal validity in a unique situation that can, cannot be repeated. The assertion that application is the actual locus of innovative behavior is founded on two assumptions. One, that nothing new can be thought of unless it is forged from a dense network of rules and laws. And two, that not a single rule conclusively states how it must be used in a particular case. With human beings, adaptation to the environment is not guaranteed by rules as such, but by a contingent application of rules, which is by definition susceptible to unexpected variations. Verbal language clearly demonstrates the intertwining of creativity and rules. Reference is again made to Chomsky, who, who distinguishes between rule-governed and rule-changing creativity. The most radical rule-changing creativity is the varied, always ambiguous transition from undefined regularity to a complex of empirical rules. The rule-changing creativity thus also has its roots in the typically human activity of placing and specifying. It coincides with a reflective judgment characterized by bringing together a multitude of sensory phenomena through the free play of the imagination. The reflective judgment is an aesthetic judgment. The reason why a discourse is innovative must be found in something other than the rules that govern it. Something, however, that is not outside of these rules, but beneath them. Rule-changing and rule-governed creativity amount to the same thing. Changing the rules only occurs there during their application. And vice versa, there can be no application of rules that does not anticipate their transformation. The consequences of this proposition are revolutionary. Unlike Virno, Giorgio Agamben has written extensively about art. In his 1970 debut, Man Without Content, he links the original structure of the artwork to human nature. Man is an emptiness. And later in the essay, the work of man to the typically human activity. In the essay, Bartleby or on contingency, he illustrates the formula of creativity or typically human activity in the novella of Melville, Bartleby the Scrivener. In Melville's novella, thinking as the preeminent figure of the Western philosophical tradition appears either dressed as a humble clerk or in the shape of, an, of the activity of writing. Agamben links the character Bartleby with the image of the desk upon which nothing is written. Bartleby is the extreme figure of the emptiness from which all creation springs, pure potentiality. Our ethical tradition has often attempted to circumvent the problem of potentiality by reducing it to will and necessity. What you want or what you should do is a prevailing theme in ethics. This is what the lawyer in the novella constantly reminds Bartleby of. When Bartleby is asked to go to the post office and he gives his customary reply, I would prefer not to, the lawyer interprets this as, you will not, to which Bartleby responds more precisely with a variation of his standard reply, I prefer not. He renounces the linguistically conditional mood according to Agamben in order to eliminate all traces of the verb to will. <clears throat> Potentiality is not the same thing as the will. To think that the will has power over potentiality and that the transition to deeds is the result of a decision that terminates the ambiguity of potentiality is the eternal moralistic illusion. It is not that Bartleby does or does not want to transcribe the text or leave the office. He would prefer not to. The formula that, 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 that is repeated time and again destroys any possible link between will and potentiality. Deleuze underlines the linguistic ungrammaticality of this expression, that disconnects words from things or acts. It disconnects the use of language from references. In fact, 
in Melville's experiment, the question is not whether something is effective or not, it is being itself an exploration of potentiality. To the extent that potentiality can be and not be, it is exempt from the conditions of verity and the principle of non-contradiction. A being that can at the same time be and not be is called contingent in philosophy. Bartleby's experiment is an exercise in contingency, and the figure of contingency coincides with the extent of human freedom. In the work of man, Agamben wonders if there is a kind of work that is typically human. He refers again to the Aristotelian proposition that the human intellect is nothing but an intellectual potentiality, an empty desk. And he finds an enlightened reading of this proposition in Dante. Developing a theory about the domain of things that are measured in time, in other words, political institutions, Dante asks whether there is a typical human activity, an end goal, towards, towards which the potentiality of mankind as a whole is aimed. This end goal cannot lie in the fact that man exists, because elements exist too, or in his complex nature, minerals are complex too, or in the fact that man is alive, so are plants, or has understanding, this we share with animals. Dante thinks that the common task of man lies in a specific type of understanding that stems from his possible intellect. Human beings do not always understand. As human thinking is exposed to the possibility of not working and can only become activity through the play of the imagination, it presupposes and requires a multitude. What Dante proposes is revolutionary. Thinking presupposes the multitudes of the crowd, the imagination and disobedience. In his debut, Man Without Content, Agamben speaks of art as the most disturbing of all things, a fact that regrettably has been forgotten by modern man. Art is dangerous not only for those who make it, but for the whole of society. And at the same time, art is a gift. This has to do with its meaning in relation to time. The original structure of work of art is its rhythm, and rhythm <clears throat> is time which flows, but also that which stops time, and changes, and resumes itself over time. Rhythm is both within time and interrupts it. When faced with a work of art, we become aware of time standing still, of an interruption, as if we suddenly find ourselves in a dimension on a primary level, outside of time. The work of art belongs to an essential dimension because time and again, it grants humanity access to its original place in history and time. Therefore, art is no luxury. It is not superfluous or just decorative. Even more, art is essential to mankind. It is a typically human activity, as described by Dante, which actualizes general potentiality in an incomplete, tentative manner. Art gives people a place, a shelter, in which they can determine the benchmarks of their stay on earth and find their own truth, written, in the unstoppable flow of linear time. As written, art stops time and beats time. It is the gift of a place of one's own. That is why all art, regardless of its medium, is architecture. But that is also why all art, regardless of its content, is disturbing and revolutionary. Bartleby's passive resistant resistance is reminiscent of the disobedience of leaving and ignoring, the prefer not to, the negation and the searching for a different place are exercises in contingency or in exodus. Contingency is the main characteristic of human practice. Institutions are incomplete and provisional and art gives mankind a place in time enabling us to acquire a familiarity with the, with the disturbing. But art too is disturbing, 
It is a dismeasure that challenges benchmarks. Art is the non-knowledge-based specialization of creativity that coincides with a typically human potentiality, which therefore belongs to everyone. This, of course, has consequences for institutions. In the light of contingency, the tragic aporia, ambiguity, instability, and the danger of the multitude, political institutions are necessarily open to their own negation. This means that they do not suppress the fight against them, the disobedience, the unruly Im imagination, or the tendency to change them. It means that they become stronger and serve their purpose better when they no longer suppress opposition and make room for the confrontation with themselves, thereby enabling themselves to change. <laughs>